Good morning, Ramp Church, and welcome all of you who are tuning in this morning. We have great faith that God is going to refresh you with the power of the Holy Spirit, that he's going to minister to you. So I want to just challenge you, Ramp Church, lean in with hunger this morning. God responds to your hunger, and he can meet you right where you're at. We have James and Becky leading worship, and we are praying that you are blessed and filled to overflowing this morning wherever you're at.
Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, the solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when things are still.
Ramp Church, let's just take a minute to pray together after that powerful worship set. So wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes, just engage your spirit. And Lord, we come before you right now, all over this city, Lord. We come before you standing in Christ's righteousness, resting on the finished work of Christ, basking in your presence because of what Jesus has done for us. And we thank you, Lord, that we have relationship with you this morning, that we have hope this morning because of what Jesus has accomplished for us. And we welcome you, Holy Spirit, into this time, into this space. Lead us, Lord, into greater love and greater understanding of who you are. And we thank you that as we position ourselves to receive, that your power is working in us as individuals and as a corporate body, Lord, that you are sustaining us and building your church all over this city. We thank you, Jesus, that we have privilege of knowing you, of worshiping you, and of growing in you together. In Jesus' name, amen. We have the final part of our Walking in Freedom series with Joe and Micah coming to you in just a minute. But before we dive into the word, I want to just provide an opportunity for us to worship the Lord with our giving. In Philippians 4, Paul is talking to the church there about the giving that they had given, financial gifts that they had given to support the kingdom work of God and that Paul was a part of. And he tells the church that the gifts they gave the money that they gave, the temporary money that they gave, was a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And Ramp Church, I want to thank you for your sacrificial giving. Because you have been giving sacrificially, worshiping God by giving of your wealth and your resources, the gospel is reaching people all over our city. We've been getting testimonies of people who are finding Jesus for the first time. Our youth have been greatly impacted by the presence of God and the word of God through this lockdown. And that's been possible because you've been giving. You've been paying for the venue space. You've been You've been enabling us to produce content that is spreading over the city, bringing hope, bringing healing. Thank you for your sacrificial giving. And I want to just encourage you, the vision is great. What we see ahead of us is a move of God in this city. And a move of God in this city is gonna be funded by you and me, by provision of our Father getting through our hands. And what he's going to do with our willingness to give is going to continue to blow us away. I'm already blown away at what God's done in this lockdown, how people have found Jesus and they found community and they have found friendship and young people have found the glory of God. And I'm so grateful that God is taking our, our small amounts and multiplying them for his kingdom. I want to just read this this promise over you that Paul gives in the very next verse in Philippians 4, after he says that your giving is a sweet smelling sacrifice to God, he says, and this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which you have, which we have been given in Christ Jesus. So as they put the giving details up, Ramp Church, let's give in faith. Let's believe that as we give our money, God's gospel is working in this city. Young people are being awakened. We are being equipped. We are being sent into our mission field. And let's do it with full assurance that as we give, God's gonna supply for every single one of our needs. Thank you for your giving, Ramp Church. And before we get into our message, I wanna spend a few minutes talking with one of my most favorite humans, Pastor Andy Elms, thank you for being with us. Now, this is a big day for you because today, your brand new book comes out and I'm having trouble knowing that what's the title of, <laughs> Soul Winner, Soul Winner, the title of your brand new book. And I, I want to tell you, if there's anybody, Ramp Church, who, that I know who's qualified to write a book about how to share the life-changing message of Jesus with people in your everyday life, it would be this man right here. I can actually remember, I was thinking about it today after you and I spoke. And I was, I'm remembering times where we've even been on the road. We've been traveling together. We've been in an Uber, in a taxi. And it's like, it could be a few minutes and you are preaching to the Uber driver. It is like, 
they need to know Jesus. It doesn't matter how much time I have with them. And so I'm so excited to get that heart, that passion, and those tools into book form. But when you and I were talking this week, I was thinking Ramp Church needs to hear about this this weekend. We have got to, we've got to get the word out and we've got to get this book in the hands of Ramp Church. If you would take five minutes just to kind of tell Ramp Church, what is this book about? Why is it relevant for this season and, and why you wrote this? Absolutely. Hey, good morning, Ramp Church. It's a joy to be with you. Always a joy to be with you. Listen, I am so excited. Today is the official launch day of um, a soul winner. And um, listen, when I was speaking to Pastor Joe and he said, would you share a few, for a few minutes? I said, absolutely. Let me at them. Because I have been meaning to write this book for many years. But the time that we're in um, really pushed me. I really felt a shove of the Holy Spirit get this book written. Because I believe at the time that we're in, is a moment where each and every one of us need to be rising up as soul winners. We often speak about Isaiah 60, where it says great darkness fills the earth. Boy, great description of today. But what does it really focus on? The rising of a light that blows out the darkness. That's you and me. Listen, the harvest field is calling us. I can remember driving around the mountains of, uh, of Tennessee once and seeing plaques and banners everywhere with an old saying that was, the mountains are calling and we must go. No, no, I've taken that. I've renamed it. The harvest is calling us wow. and we must go. You see, the harvest is a calling. Every one of us, not the pastors, not the leaders, not the evangelists, not the celebrity superstar, the greatest showman evangelist, you, me. We're all called to be soul winners in the harvest field. Now, we need to understand that actually the health of our church is found in us responding to the Great Commission. Co is an amazing thing, isn't it? The Bible says that we have been co-crucified. What does that mean? His crucifixion became ours. There's a togetherness in it. When we speak about being co-heirs, it says he's made us an heir to the father, a joint heir with himself. But let's never forget the Great Commission was never a great suggestion, and it certainly should never be a great omission. Every one of us are called to be harvesters and soul winners. I've written this book to equip you, to show you how to do it. 30 years of leading people to the Lord in restaurants, bars, uh, trains, planes. I've crammed it all in this book. It's a how-to um, written book. I've written on the front everything you need to know, everything, to lead now, another person. Oftentimes when people think about this, they're thinking stage evangelism, like the, the job of saving people, that comes from a pastor on a stage. This book takes a different angle, though, doesn't it? The stages are shut down. We're going back to an original model here. Listen, there's too many pastors right now that are, are saying, oh, well, we just hope when we do open our gates again, like they're sitting at the gates waiting for them to open. The church was never a meeting. It was never a building. It was always a community of people called out of darkness into light with a mission to take the harvest field for Jesus. We're coming back. We're resetting in this moment. I want to encourage you. You know, when I've spoken to pastors, I said, that's not my plan. My plan for family churches, I'm going to use this moment that we're in. God's not outside of this moment i'm going to use this moment to equip as many people in my church that i can to be effective soul winners so that one day when we do open the doors again yes they're coming back but also they've got a person on their right arm a person on their left arm they're saying meet jack meet molly i led them to the lord what you didn't have a stage you didn't have a meeting you didn't have an altar call no i did it i did it in a supermarket listen you say yeah yeah that's what i need i just don't know how this is why i've written the book seriously i'm so passionate about this book i really believe that the anointing of god was on me and this book is going to turn seated saints into effective soul winners wow. everything how to start a conversation how to know the wisdom of God in communicating Christ to others. Um, at the beginning, I take the Great Commission, you know, because especially if you read it in the King James, Pastor Joe, it's like, go ye into all the world and preach. Where do I get started with that? We start by de-spooking it. God's not asking you to go get a box and stand in the high street. He's asking you to see your Jerusalem, that it's your friends, your family, your bespoke world, that world that's unique to you, filled with the people that are unique in relation. God wants you. He's given you the power of the Holy Spirit to take your Jerusalem for him. Listen, the harvest is calling, Ramp Church. And I know, Ramp Church, you're the same as us. We don't want to wait until the gates of the school open and see what's left after COVID. Get out of here. What sort of vision is that? Now, let's do something that's more godly. Let's equip the saints. That's you and me 
to be effective soul winners in the harvest field that when we open our doors one day, and now don't get me wrong, I'm looking forward to regathering, but I'm not going to miss this moment of scattering. When God brought a scattering in Acts 8, it didn't break the church. It reset the church in the harvest field. Listen, the harvest field's calling you. Your harvest field, I don't know how to do it. Stop saying that. I am going to teach you everything you need to know to lead another person to Christ. You can't save them, but you better believe that God is holding you and me responsibility for letting them know. And if we don't rise to that moment, what are we doing here? In, in a world right now where people are saying, I'm scared, I'm confused, I don't know the way. It's ripe, it's ripe, it's ripe, it's ripe. 2,000 years ago when Jesus said the fields are ripe, but the workers are so few. Yes, they were, he had a small team, but not now. Apparently in a world of 7.7 .7 billion people, there are 2.2 billion Christians or people that claim they're Christians. How come the other five billion aren't saved quicker? Because people are sitting on their blessed assurance. They're leaving evangelism to a few people on a stage. Listen, we're all in this. God has called you and me, not me a pastor, me a person to be reaching in. Have I got any relatives that don't know Jesus yet? I'm going to bring them to the king. Remember when Andrew got born, when Andrew first met Jesus, the first thing he did was go get his brother. It's time. It's time. Listen to the harvest field. You can tell I'm excited, right? Seriously, get a copy of this. You will read it and you'll say, I can do that. I can do that. I can oh, do that. I love, I love yes, that you're yes. excited. I love that you're Thank excited. You. And, and when we spoke Ramp Church, I asked him, I said, we, we've got to get this message to Ramp Church right away. And not only that, I have some amazing news. We're partnering with a publisher and Ramp Church. This is special. Okay, this is a special moment. If you go to ramp.church slash soul winner, and you sign up, the first 50 people to sign up are going to get a free copy of this book. That, that's how much I believe in this message. I believe this has the power to transform communities across Greater Manchester. I believe it has the power to transform your life, and I believe it has the power to transform Ramp Church. That when we can get this message in us, and we can get it through us, that, that what I'm imagining is a soul-winning movement that's coming through Ramp Church. And so that's why I so believe in it that we want to give away 50 copies of this. So ramp.church slash soul winner. You can even find out more information about the book, about Pastor Andy at soulwinner.co.uk. Of course, Pastor Andy's on every social channel at Andy Elms. And of course, he's a mentor in my life, a father in my life. He's, he's a, a father uh, for Ramp Church. But I want you to get on board, Ramp Church, with this book, with this movement, and uh, and I want to get it into your hands. Um, any any closing words, Pastor, Andy, before we move on? Just simply, you know, people often say it's about my closeness to Jesus. It's about I just need more proximity with Jesus. All right, yeah, I'm up for that. But if you're sitting on the Father's lap and your head is against His heart, mm -hmm. you're not going to miss His heartbeat. Wow. Souls, 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 but none would perish. We can't do evangelism from a stage anymore. It doesn't work like it should, but it was never meant to. Lifestyle evangelism. This is a handbook for lifestyle evangelism. And I promise you, it's going to fire you up. Incredible. Ramp Church, I know you're excited. I'm excited. So let's jump on board with this. Ramp.church slash soulwinner. Soulwinner.co.uk. Pastor Andy, we love you. Oh, we love you guys. We love you guys so much. You, you are us and we are you. Thank you for spending this time with us. Ramp Church, stick around. We're going into the final part of our Walking in Freedom series that starts right now. Hey, Ramp Church. I'm so, so thrilled um, to be finishing up our series on Walking in Freedom. So mm -hmm. I'm here with Pastor Michael Wood. Thank you for being I with us. I love doing it. Uh, this series has been a blast. And um, uh, Micah, if you're just now um, meeting him, he's the pastor of Ramp Church in Hamilton, Alabama. So we kind of have the same job on two different parts of the That's planet. Right. Yeah. So uh, this is the original location of Ramp Church. So so much of what we do, what we're doing in Manchester, we owe to this guy and, and what they're modeling here. So um, I, I'm really excited about this 
this part, uh, this final part, because in many ways, this is where the rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. So you've talked about your story, which yes. we can we can all glean from. We can see the, the, the powerful way that God works, his love and his design, uh, his desire for, for our freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and then l the last session, we talked about the theological kind of underpinnings or foundation mm -hmm. for thinking about walking in freedom and God's ultimate goal and priority for his interactions mm -hmm. uh, with us and the way he's dealing with us. But this one, um, we're going to start by talking about, well, I've given my life to Jesus. I, I would consider myself a Jesus follower. Um, I feel like I've been, uh, you know, saved, uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to use a word that we use all the time in church. Um, why do I keep struggling with sin? Mm -hmm. Um and but we're also going that's gonna that discussion can naturally lead into then what do I do about that struggle? Yes. <clears throat> and so if those are some questions you have, I just want to encourage you to stick around. But what how would you even start mm -hmm. answering that question to I mean, I feel like I've given my life to God. You know, I thought everything was gonna change. Mm -hmm. I thought this was the community of people where they have perfect lives. That's why mm -hmm. I joined Ramp Church. Um, if you've been around for any length of time, you realize that's not the case. But what is, you know, why is that? Yeah. Well, let, and I'll start with, with the way I've had to wrestle with that personally. Okay. And the way pastorally I, I've, I've yeah. had to wrestle with that. Okay. Because in my own life, you know, I shared my story in, this first, in the first session of this uh, little series here. Um, you know, there were all those cycles mm -hmm. of in and out of church and in and out of altar moments with God and... And Lord, I, I, I've, I've kind of been around this thing and I've been hopeful, but now I'm hopeless. And what is all that about? And, mm -hmm. and that moment where I really encountered your love, mm -hmm. that wasn't the first time. Why, what made that one stick? What made that one be like a catalyst moment for long-term transformation? Yeah. And so I had to else, I've wrestled with that personally. And then I've wrestled with that, with that a lot pastorally. Okay. You know, when I share my story about freedom from sexual addiction and yep. pornography and walking with God, I get young men, especially young men, but young women too, emailing me, sending me messages. Hey, I heard your story. And they ask this question like, how did you do it? You wow. know, there's always that like, I, you know, I came to the altar, okay. but, but I didn't have the same experience. Like Whoa. I had the love of God, but I don't, wow. I don't see the long-term freedom. I can hear, I can even hear in those questions, uh, you know, not to exaggerate, but you can you can sense the despair. There, that there is, there right. is, especially after you hear a story and come to a moment at yeah, an altar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you like think, a little bait and switch. I was like, uh, you know, thought, I thought I thought I did what God wanted me to do. I yeah, responded, yeah. but I don't see the same reality. Yeah. And so that that sent me on a course of really wrestling first theologically with some things like we talked about in the last session. The, you know, the way we think about God. That quote from Tozer. Because we are the handiwork of God, yep. it thus follows that all of our problems and their solutions are theological. Wow. So we, we start with that wrestling, are we thinking rightly, Lord, about this? Are we thinking rightly about you? Are we think, asking the right questions? And from that place, then looking at the practical application of it and how that plays out. So let's kind of go back to the last session where our principle was this. Grace saves us from sin. We see that everywhere in the New Testament. When we, when we look for it, we see it everywhere. Yes. Grace saves us from sin. Yes. But then you have to ask the follow-up question, if grace saves us from sin, why do we still deal with sin sometimes after we, as you use the phrase, get saved? Yeah. And so in response to that question, the Lord gave me a verse. Okay. And it comes out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 10. Mm -hmm. And let me say this idea, and then we'll look at the verse to sort of okay. provide the substance. Though the grace of God saves us from sin, mm -hmm. The grace of God does not remove the role of our will in serving God. Wow. Say, say that again. So, though the grace of God saves us from sin, yes. it does not remove the role of our will yep. in serving God. So, you're saying I have a part to play. Yes. It doesn't remove the role of our choice. Okay. It doesn't remove the role of our actions. Okay. So a lot of times we think, if God's going to save me from sin, yep. then I no longer have to choose mm -hmm. to not sin. Okay. I just won't. Yeah, it, uh, and even the appetite, we, we assume that even the appetite leaves. That's right. 
So we think to ourselves, if I face temptation, and this is the, this is the trap I got into mentally for years. Okay. If I come to an altar and God touches me, and I go back to the temptation and the sin, then I blame it on God. And I say something like this, I guess God didn't set me free. Wow. And what I'm saying is, I'm not responsible for the sin or the action I just did. Okay, God, God is. is. Because he said he would set me free. Wow. Therefore, if I go back to it, he it's must on him. Have, it's on him. And so, yes, the grace of God does remove the, the principle and the power of sin in our lives, but it does not remove the role of our will in serving God. So then we said earlier on in this series, the grace of God liberates the will. It doesn't bind the will. Wow. It liberates the will to choose right and wrong. Okay. But it doesn't make us a slave to righteousness the way we were a slave to sin. Wow, that is huge. If we expect God to make us a slave to righteousness, we're missing the point that he wants to make us sons. Wow. And daughters. Okay. So prior to grace, we are slaves to sin. We can't expect him to then make us slaves to righteousness. Okay. We don't become slaves of righteousness. That's why the New Testament apostles would some, sometimes say, I'm a bond slave mm. of Jesus. A bond slave is not someone who is forcefully taken from their homeland and made into a slave. A bond slave is someone who said, I choose to, to be your servant. Wow. I choose to surrender my will. I choose to bring my life into submission. So is this, why, is this why we see in the New Testament this theme of that there's a war Mm -hmm. And they would call it the, uh, the flesh or the world or the devil. That's right. That there's a war. Is it that before, before Jesus, there was no war? That's right. You, you, are, you are a rebel through and through. There is no war before Jesus. Yeah. So when he liberates you through the power of his grace, you suddenly wake up to the war that's in existence. It's, wow. like, it's like C.S. Lewis said, we are all born in enemy territory. Okay. But we don't even know we're born in, in, into enemy wow. territory until we get saved. Okay. And at salvation, our will is liberated mm -hmm. to then choose the right against the wrong. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of ways to describe that. But again, the role of our will in serving God is really captured in 1 Corinthians 15.10. Yes. So Paul said it like this. I love this scripture packs so much into one place. Actually, the whole chapter. The whole, chapter, whole chapter. Oh, so my rich. goodness. Yeah. So Paul is describing his own apostolic ministry throughout both First and Second Corinthians. Mm -hmm. And as he's describing it, he says something, but there's a principle there for each of us. And he okay. starts off like this. For by the grace of God, I am what I am. Now, he okay. goes on, but you just meditate on that. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And he's describing his own call to be an apostle. And he's saying, listen, everything that I am, I am by grace. Wow. I didn't get here by self-effort. Self mm -hmm. I didn't get here by self-will. Mm -hmm. I didn't get here because I just had what it takes. Yeah. And so it's that's where it's a gift from God. So when people ask me, you know, 15 plus years not looking at pornography, how did you do it? My first response is, by the grace of God, I am what I am. <laughs> In other words, wow. apart from grace... You can't sign up for an effective accountability program yep. that's going to cause sustained transformation. You can't, you can't employ the right kinds of habits. Yep. There may be you know, a surface level change, but your internal world will yeah. still be captive yes. to that principle of sin, that, that principle of rebellion against God. Yes. So Paul starts off, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And that is the testimony of every single Christian in the history of the world. Anything we become, we become by the power of so grace. So this isn't let me dive into the the self help section at my local bookstore. That's right. And figure out how to how to uh, uh, how to adopt all these habits mm -hmm. that then that then renew me out of this this old hang up. That's you're, right. you're saying the starting point is completely different. Starting point is completely different, and that's why sometimes when someone asks me the question. How do you practically no longer look at pornography? Yeah, I'm hesitant to even reply because okay. I'm like, if I give you the practical, I give you steps. If I give you steps, I'm skipping like the, most important. the meat of the message. 
there are steps, there are practicals, there are patterns, there are habits. I, I, wanna, I would love we, to go into some of those. Yeah, that, in a bit. that you do adopt. Yeah. But those are all the expression of the grace that's only, only wow. in operation on the inside of you. As you said a moment ago, it's not an outside in, it's an inside out. So it's, so it's a response to the grace. It's in, a, in a response. Sense. It's a reaction to what God does. That's what some theologians like John Wesley called prevenient grace. Yeah. There was a grace that intervened. I see. And then you respond to that yeah. through behavior. Okay. So, for by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's where Paul starts. It's all by the power of grace. But then he goes on to say this, and this is the really startling, sobering part of the verse. Okay. For by the grace of God, I am what I am, but his grace toward me was not in vain. Mm. When you think about that, again, it's very sobering. Mm. The phrase in vain means it wasn't wasted. Yes. So Paul, in saying that I did not waste God's grace toward me, it implies you can waste God's grace toward you. Whoa. In other words, here's what Paul's saying. God called me to be an apostle, and by the grace of God, I became an apostle. But that grace to become an apostle, that ability from him, it was not wasted. In other words, I could have wasted. He could have called me to be an apostle, yep. and he could have given me that grace, and I could have wasted that grace and not become what he's called me to become. So you look at it in the context of sin and this principle of living in freedom. God can call us to freedom, and he does, and he can give us the grace to walk in freedom, because he does, and we can waste that grace by not walking in freedom. Wow. So, I mean, to take this back to the story you told earlier, when you somebody would respond to a message, a call, or a prayer, and they would, they would, they would make a decision to give this situation to Jesus, to invite him into mm -hmm. their life, uh, and then they go back to the thing that they thought they gave over to God, and then they blame God. You're saying Paul is addressing that dynamic right. there. Um, that, yeah, that Paul's addressing that, and he's saying it's not that God didn't give didn't you exercise the grace. appropriate level of grace. Okay. It's that you wasted what he gave you. That's and that is, that is honestly, it's painful. It's harsh, yeah, and painful. I don't even like saying it Yeah, yeah, yeah. because it feels offensive. Yeah. But again, as we talked about earlier, it's important to properly diagnose where we are. Very good. And to think appropriately. So if I go to an altar, and again, I, I supposedly surrender a sin to Jesus and say, I don't, I don't like this, I don't want this anymore, I repent, I bring it to you, and I go back to it, that's not on him. Mm. That's on me. Yeah. But does that mean, I mean, saying. does that mean the grace is gone? I mean, if, if it's been in vain once, if I've wasted it, like, so you... Yeah. So to speak, like, is that it? Have I lost my chance? Well, the, I mean, the, the good news is that John says in John chapter 1, and of his grace we have received grace upon grace. Oh, wow. And so what he's saying is he's using the imagery of waves on an ocean. Wow. That it keeps coming. That's how merciful God is. Those waves of grace, it's grace upon grace upon grace. He is there when we're ready to receive it and walk it out. He is there ready to give it. So it's just beautiful how merciful God is. And this, this by the way, is a little bit of a distingu distinguishing factor between grace and mercy. Because mm. sometimes we bo put them into we, some we one, do, yeah. but it's his mercy. Difference? Okay, so I would say it like this. Mercy restrains, okay. grace gives. Oh, wow. So mercy restrains what we do deserve. Mm. Grace gives us what we don't deserve. Amazing. And so it is the mercy of God mm. that continually restrains, for instance, judgment. We don't like those themes, but yeah, 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 that yeah. It, it restrains the lack. In other words, when we waste God's grace, we deserve to get no more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. because He's merciful, yeah. He restrains that withholding. Yeah. And then he gives us the grace again. Yeah, I kind of think of it so. like I just flew internationally. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of like connecting flights. And I'm not the best like person with time. You, you know, for me, time <laughs> is just like this like gray, vague, gray area, um, which really freaks my wife out when I'm traveling by myself because she's the one that makes sure I don't miss airplanes. Yes. But uh, I kind of think of it like this. I have missed an airplane before. That's not a shocker to anybody. But there's, there's a sense when you arrive and they've already closed the gate, they can have mercy on you and go, nah, okay, one more. Mm -hmm. That's mercy. That, you know, I don't have to receive this. They're restraining that. They let me in. But there's a totally different thing if they were to go, hey, here's an extra ticket. 
Mm -hmm. That's right. Does that make sense? Yes. That's not something I even earned. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's beyond what it, even my yes. ability. So I, I don't get the payment mm -hmm. for, for what I deserve, mercy. Mm -hmm. I get something that I, that I could never earn, That's right. grace. That's right. Is, is, is that another way yes. to think about that? Yeah, absolutely. And again, so if salvation is we are saved by grace, so it's not just, salvation is not just the mercy of God restraining judgment. Wow. It is the grace of God to overcome sin. Amazing. It's the so empowerment. So talk to me now about what is Paul getting at? Yeah. What's the will aspect of it? Yeah, so he goes on. So we've only quoted half of the verse so far. Yeah. He says, for by the grace of God, I am what I am. Grace may, it's all the grace of God. And his grace toward me was not in vain. I didn't waste that grace. And then he explains how he didn't waste it in the next phrase. There's four phrases. So this is the third phrase. In the next phrase, he says this, For I labored more abundantly than they all. Hmm. In other words, he's saying, God called me to be an apostle. Okay. He gave me the grace to be an apostle. And I didn't waste that grace. And here's why. When he gave me the grace, I turned that grace into action. Wow. I did something with it. I did and establish habits. I did establish disciplines. I did do practical things that activated God's grace. I didn't wait around for just my freedom to materialize. And this is important because again, I talk about sexual freedom. Sexual freedom doesn't mean every time you're tempted, this magical thing called grace comes in, walks into your bedroom, mm. takes your phone out of your hand, puts it on the dresser and ties you up in a corner you know, with your hands underneath yeah. your thighs until you until the temptation passes. Wow. But sometimes we act like that's what grace does. Yeah. If I have any kind of desire Urge for sin or, anymore, yeah. Yeah. then grace is somehow grace not effective. Grace keeps me from sinning. That's right. Yeah. But the reality is that grace empowers us to act according to God's will. Amazing. According to righteousness. Same thing with prayer, lifestyle of prayer. So God's called us all to be people of prayer, you know, as disciples. That doesn't mean every morning at 5 a.m., yeah. the grace of God pulls back the covers, gets you yes. out of the bed, puts you on your knees, yes. and all of a sudden Moves you feel your, your diaphragm moving, yeah, and, right, right. and you just wake up praying. That's not, yeah. no. What grace and operation looks like is you set your alarm. Yeah. And you know, you hit it, you wake up, and you make yeah. yourself a cup of coffee, and you start yes. doing it. And then as we act according to what God's called us to do, mm -hmm. Then we experience the last phrase, we find grace in operation. And that's where Paul said this, For the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace toward me was not in vain. For I labored more abundantly than they all. I actually did something. And then he wraps it up by saying, Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Hmm. He begins and ends with grace. In other words, what he's saying is this, Though I labored, even the desire to labor was not me. It was a product of God's grace. And that's what we were saying earlier. It's not just work hard and you'll be better. It's surrender to grace and act according to that grace. Mm -hmm. And as you do, you'll find God doing in you stuff that you can't it's do beyond, on your own. It's beyond your efforts. And on the outside looking in, it looks like you're a disciplined person. Yeah. But you know the real secret is that though you may be adding or, or subtracting from your life and establishing new habits, the inside story is that it's His grace functioning in you the whole time. Amazing. One of the things I love about what you just said was you're not just applying this principle um, in a negative sense in our life. In other words, to stop doing things we wish we stopped. But you just, you, you just said prayer. Mm -hmm. So the same principle works actually when we want to start doing yeah. things in our life that yes. we know we're called to do. What a powerful reality of this this um, co-laboring of God's mm -hmm. grace and my will and then his grace, which mm -hmm. makes my my will fruitful and my mm -hmm. actions fruitful. So, you know, in this theme that we're in right now of walking in freedom, mm -hmm. let's, let's get to some practicals on, mm -hmm. and I know there's a danger in me even going sure, here because- it's important. Yeah, because we can make this the first and, and the last point when it's really meant to sit in the middle of these mm -hmm. of these grace bookends. But if somebody's genuinely desiring to walk in freedom in a certain area, what are some things they can do when they know I've experienced God's grace? In other words, I have a new nature, 
but I want to start exercising new patterns in my mm-hmm. life to leave room for God then to come in and, and do what I'm unable to do. Mm-hmm. What are some of those patterns that they can start to employ? Yes, the number one pattern, yep. the number one in everything else is a derivative of this, yep. everything else. Okay. The number one pattern is in a practical way develop a walk with God okay. through a lifestyle of prayer and reading, studying Scripture. Okay, that is prayer the, and Scripture. Prayer and Scripture. Those are the two components of walking with God. And the reason why I say develop in a practical way a walk with God, sometimes we use that word walk with God in a very general yeah, sort it's of abstract. God awareness. Yeah. I'm walking down the street and I'm okay. thinking about God, so I walk with God. I see. And so I mean in, in a very practical way, like, like on our schedules, we treat it as an, a daily appointment. Wow. There is specific time yes. where we are intentionally focusing our mind on God in prayer. It's going to be uncomfortable at first because yeah. we're just developing, yeah. again, new muscles, so to speak, new habits. Intentionally setting our minds with God in a place of prayer and reading Scripture. Now, again, I say that carving out the time because, and this is not bad. I love when people do this. Um, but a lot of times people love to pray when they're on a run or, you know, they're listening to the yeah. Bible at the gym yeah. or, yeah. or you know, on a commute to work. Yes. And I love all those avenues. I do all those avenues. I think that's important. But that's still not what I'm talking about. Okay, so it's not the same as no, what you're it's saying It's not here. the same. That, that general awareness of God, that's more of like a, a general sense of communion with God throughout the day. That's yeah. important. But what I mean is a specific rhythm okay. of I have an appointed time with God in prayer and in the Bible. Wow. And when that becomes a rhythm in our lives yep. every single day, yep. from that place, every other discipline flows. Wow. And if we try to establish other disciplines without establishing that one, everything else will fail. Wow. So, I mean, you know, there's no way to make this mathematical, right. but to help us to kind of think through this, if all the disciplines I'm going to employ in my life to find freedom, to walk in freedom, is 100%. You know, what are we talking about here? 80% of the journey is through is 60%, 40%. I mean, you know, where are we at right here? Like, I need, yeah. to, I need to give a lot of effort to this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say, I, I'm not quite sure how to answer the question yeah. in mathematical terms, but I would say a high percent is like 90% above. I mean, that's huge. I mean, that is huge. And because here's why. Because the, the Christian experience yep. was never designed to be follow rules to be a better person. Wow. It was always designed to be a relationship yep. that then out of the context of relationship, you make your decisions. So it isn't behavioral, behavioral, full, no. behavioral modification. No. So that's why you're saying, I mean, 90 plus percent, that it's... That's mad. I mean, you're almost there. Yeah, because, and, and here's what happened for me, and it goes back to my experience. After those encounters with God that yep. were really catalyst moments yep. of I knew I was experiencing God's grace, as my walk with God developed in a specific way with yes. prayer and the Word, all of a sudden I became very concerned about the nature of my relationship with God. Wow. And from that place of concern and desire, I didn't want to do things that that grieved his heart. Yes. That's one way to say it. But I don't want to do things that would become obstacles when I went to pray. Yeah. In other words, I didn't want to look at pornography anymore because when I go to pray, all I can think about is how I looked at pornography. Yeah. And it's like it, I begin to realize this is a barrier. This is an yeah. obstacle. Yeah to this, this rich relationship with God. It, 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 it makes me think, as I'm listening to you talk, you know, and, and when, we, when we, we try to bring very concrete, clear lines and categorical um, uh, um, kind of themes into this discussion because it's easier to teach. But when you live, it's more in a story. It's in a narrative mm-hmm. form. And it almost sounds like what you're saying is, is we receive this initiation of grace from mm-hmm. God, but... Would would you go far as to say that in prayer and in in reading the Bible that we find new avenues of grace? Yes, we do. I would say that absolutely. And I would say this, we also experience an increase of grace. Wow. So the Apostle Peter said, may grace and peace 
be multiplied to you. Wow. So you can experience an increase of grace's operation in your life. Yep. May grace be small. And then he tells us the that's avenue. Huge. I mean, that's huge. That's huge. And then he tells us the avenue it comes through. Okay. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God in our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. So the avenue that grace increases in our lives is through the avenue of the knowledge of God. Wow. The more intimately we know God, the more we find grace operating in our lives, which empowers us to live godly, to live in a way that pleases God, and it's not about, I know God, I prayed more so I get more right, of God's favor. Right, it's not right, about that. Right. It's just the place that God's made grace available is through the avenue of knowing Him. This, this seems both, I get this sense, it seems both incredibly practical. It seems both pragmatic and mysterious, mystical, yes. all at the same time. I, as in, and I think sometimes maybe we, we, we swap those two, like, the mystical thing is the prayer in the in the Bible study, mm -hmm. and the practical thing is, well, God's going to set me free, and then it's over with. Mm -hmm. When I almost get a sense that those are swapped now, it's like mm -hmm. the prayer in the Bible study, it, all it is is just facilitating mm -hmm. this mysterious grace. Yes. And if you take away the facilitation, it's not about you haven't checked the box now. Mm -hmm. It's about... Where's the avenue now for God's yes. grace to now That's invade right. my life yes. that I can continue the journey of freedom? Yes. Is, is that kind of overstretching or maybe pulling no, that metaphor a bit too that, far? That's a, that's a way even like a picture in my mind that I see it is every day when I'm, when I'm in a place of walking with God in the secret place. And again, yeah. it's not about did I miss a day or not. Right, you know, it's right, not right. That right. Kind it's of not this legalistic. scorecard sort of a... No, it's, but it's when I put my heart into a place of specific communion with God. Yeah. What I'm doing is is I am, I am. It's like I'm turning on a faucet. Wow! It's just this is the place where God distributes grace Amazing. into my life and Amazing. increases its operation. So now, what what would what would you say? And we we've got to go here. We don't want to overemphasize it because you know we're talking less than ten percent of of what I need to put into action here. But what is that? What's in that category? Yeah. So another thing practically to do. This is super simple. For any level of addiction, uh, of course, but especially in the arena of sexual addiction, yep. um, recognize trigger points ah. and avoid them. Okay. And it sounds really simple, yeah. but there's a scripture in Proverbs that really helped me on this because I, I kept thinking to myself, "Am I if I'm having to avoid trigger points, I'm not really free. Then I'm not really free. Yeah. When really, according to the scripture, we're wise. Mm. So the Bible says in Proverbs, a wise man sees danger coming and hides himself. Amazing. So that scripture spoke deeply to me about the sustained life of freedom. Okay. That I think about what are danger areas for me yeah. and how can I hide myself from them. Wow. So an example, early on in my marriage, if I was ever in a situation where my wife was not going to be home, yeah. I refused to turn on the television or open my computer. Wow. Of course, now that would include being on my smartphone, but it didn't exist by then. Yeah. Okay, so I refused to be on television or be on my computer. Why? Because I'm ahead of time, before I get to that moment, I'm looking and I'm saying, that is a dangerous scenario. Yeah. Why would I even play with the possibility yeah. of accessing pornography? Yeah. Why yeah. would I even play with that possibility? Yeah. So I'm going to, ahead of time, if my wife is not at home, mm. there's no reason to have a screen on. Mm. I'll be in the Word. I'll be in prayer. I'll take a nap. You know, same thing. Same thing now to this day. To this day, now, even though it's been over 15 years with pornography, to this day, if I'm in a hotel room by myself, I never turn the television on. Wow. The first thing I do when I walk into the hotel room is I take the remote, I put it in a drawer, and I shut it. Mm. I don't even feel the pull. It's not even that I feel yeah, the pull yeah, to turn yeah. it on and see what's going on. I, I, it's, it's just a statement yeah. that in wisdom, yeah. I'm recogni recognizing a, a possibility of vulnerability yeah. I'm going to hide myself from an advance. Wow, it's become a pattern. It's, it's just a pattern. You don't live for the pattern. The pattern serves you. Mm -hmm. But but it is it is it is laboring according to the grace that's yes. been given you. Yeah. It's very simple things, very practical things that re then release that grace. In, in, anything else in that ten percent? Uh, those trigger points. I think. What another, about other people? Bringing other people yeah, involved. That would be my next thing: is being brutally honest. Okay with someone in your life that you look up to on a spiritual level. Mm. 
and I say someone you look up to because that's really important. Um, sometimes we think of accountability is someone else is struggling with the same thing I'm struggling with and hey, I looked at pornography and yeah. they say, hey, I looked at pornography. Man, well don't feel too bad about it. You I either, because I did yeah. too. Yeah. And, and that kind of accountability, I'm not saying there's no value, but I have rarely seen sustainable freedom come out of that kind of account okay. accountability because okay. I've seen that a lot yes. um, in pastoring people. So where I have seen um, more transformation happen is when you become brutally honest with someone you look up to. I don't even necessarily use the language leader. Mm. If, there, if it's a leader you have access to, great, but someone you look it up to. It doesn't have to be a leader. So for me, it was like an older brother. It was yeah. you, it was Samuel Bentley, yeah. and I care deeply about the opinions yeah, of my good. older brothers. Yeah. And I honor their walk with God. I honor their relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And man, I remember being terrified. One time I had to call Samuel. And I didn't even look at pornography. It was a, it was a movie that was outside of our values as a yeah. team. Yeah. You know, there were certain commitments we made to entertainment choices. And so yeah, I watched yeah, a movie. Yeah. It was just outside those values. I used some language. And, and so I called Samuel. I was like, man, I, you know, I watched this movie. And, and I just want to be honest. And the reason I watched it is because I was embarrassed to turn it off through other people in the room. And you know, I, I confessed that to him, and he was like, well, don't do it again. You know, yeah, just same yeah. So I'm like, okay, I won't. Man, about three weeks later, I was in a similar scenario. I was with my family. Like, not my – I wasn't even married then. So, like, my brothers and sisters, you know. And so we're watching a movie. They use, they use this language that, again, was grieving to me. Yeah, it was just compromise for you. Compromise for me. So I just I – just, I continued to watch it. And when I had to call Samuel the second time – within a month and say, you know, Samuel, I watched this movie again. And it's not even that he was mean, it's just the embarrassment level and his disappointment made me say within myself, I never want to experience this again. Wow. And the simplicity of just confessing yeah. and being brutally honest mm -hmm. um, to someone I looked up to, yeah. it, it created its own kind of accountability. Mm -hmm. Again, that's where Maybe shame is too strong of a word, but embarrassment can use play a really healthy yeah. role. Yeah. And so anyway, so that's another practical thing. So I think that that walk with God is key. Number two, recognizing those trigger points. Mm -hmm. We see danger areas, we hide ourselves. Number three, being accountable to someone older than us in the faith, even if they're younger than us, younger than us, someone we look up to in their walk to to be a safe place of confession, honesty, accountability, prayer. Those are some key, key components. Incredible. Well, I, I don't know about you, but this has just been transformative. Um, this whole series has been amazing. And I, here's what I'm imagining. I'm imagining what it's going to look like when individuals all across our faith family, and even those of you that have been a part of this series that aren't a part of the Ramp Church family, are finding freedom in, in, in a fresh way. Yeah, I, I think you're going to find a whole new experience in life not just in this one area, but I think it's going to bring life, vitality, satisfaction, fulfillment to everything you're doing. But I also imagine what it's going to mean for our church family. Mm. I think it's going to mean deepening relationships. I think it's going to be more honesty between us, that genuine community. But I think we'll also see the grace of God, the supernatural help of God that starts to back our efforts in a fresh way as we open up new and fresh avenues for His grace to pour into our everyday lives and into our corporate, corporate reality as a faith family. Well, Michael, would you close us mm -hmm. in prayer? Yes. Um, just along the lines of these themes that we've talked mm -hmm. about, um, to help lead those that are watching yes. into this into this journey. Yes, I would love to. So, Lord, I thank you that you have given us your grace through your Son, Jesus Christ. Yes. And Father, I ask that your truth right now would renew each of us, that we would think differently about whatever it is that we're facing, and that, Lord, as we uh, uh, grow in those areas, as we bring those to you in prayer, that we would have a new level of awareness concerning our responsibility to, Lord, to act, to do, not in our own strength, but as, a, as an act of trust in your power that's at work with only inside of us. Mm -hmm. And so, Lord, I ask that um, as a community, Lord, that we would grow in that area of vulnerability. We'd grow in that area of accountability. We would grow in that area of confession. Lord, I thank you that in the church, it is the safest place to confess, 
confess issues. The safest place to confess problems and sins. That, Lord, we walk together in gentleness and patience, knowing that we are all growing into the image of Christ. So, Father, I bless Ramp Church and all those that are watching this video, and I thank you for the grace you've given us to walk in a life that you've called us to walk in. In Jesus' name, amen. Set me free, break every chain holding me, deliverer, come have your way, I surrender to your rule and reign, for where the Just say the word, mountains are moved, oceans and stars stand in awe of you. Just say the word, and I will be changed. You'll see the face, and we will not be the same. Oh, just say the word, mountains are moved. Your blood 
Enough. 